Okay, 7.05, so let's start. Okay, welcome everyone. Today we have prepared some interesting stuff. Hope you all learn some new things along the way. So first, uh, this is how we'll do the challenges later. We'll give 12 minutes for each challenge. It will either be something, uh, there will be some vulnerability in the code or, or the crypto one, you have to break the cipher. Or for the RE reverse engineering challenge, you have to reverse the code and find out what it does. So we'll first give three minutes just for everyone to think about the stuff, the code, and just don't discuss in the chat. But after the three minutes, I'll let everyone know and everyone can just feel free to discuss the ideas in the chat. Then five minutes later, we'll release one hint and eight minutes after that, we'll uh, in three more minutes after that, we will release the second hint. But the first one that gives the correct answer in the chat, uh, there will be a $10 price uh, grab voucher. It is separate from the feedback form later, so you can get extra money today. You can just feel free to say in the chat so everyone knows the answer. Uh, everyone knows that someone has solved it. Or if you don't want, you can also just DM the challenge author, so it's either me or Kelsey later. Yeah, it's up to you. So now let's just start with the first challenge. So we'll start with web first. So now I have this simple code snippet, and suppose that this one is a server program written in Node.js, and it receives two pieces of uh, information from the user. One is a file path, and the second one is some data. So this server, it just uh, saves that data over here. It writes that data into the path that the user specifies. But normally when we write a server like this, we don't want the user to be able to save the file anywhere, right? Because it might overwrite certain things. For example, uh, on a Linux server, we don't want the user to be able to write to say, uh, slash EDC slash uh, password or any, where else with important or sensitive info. So there's this strip absolute path that will aim to strip away uh, stuff in front of the file path so that it becomes a relative file path that uh, so that when the server wants to write the file, it will be writing to a relative file path uh, somewhere in the current working directory. So now I'll start the type and see if you all can find out what is wrong here. Uh, Daniel is the challenge author for this challenge. Yes. So the first three minutes is 7.08 until 
Okay, the first three minutes is up. Uh, so if you guys want to share your ideas in the chat, uh, then know that is okay, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, by the way, I made a mistake in the challenge. <laughs> uh, let me think. Of it. Yeah, someone gave me the answer already. But it was not that was not meant to be the answer. Okay. Um okay, the one possible answer is you can give a dot dot slash dot dot slash a lot of dot dot slash and you can access the you can access some uh wherever you want. But let's just assume that this code it uh it blocks that. Uh it blocks a dot dot slash if there's a dot dot slash in front. Let me add some annotation. Because that was not the intended answer, uh, not the intended boundary. Wait. Hey, someone has given me the answer already. Uh, he should, and it's correct. But the rest, y'all can feel free to discuss in the chat. Since the the price is already clean. Uh, five minutes has, has passed. Oh, here's a series. If you have a local setup for Node.js, you can check uh, check out what the functions return. So can shortcuts to other paths work here? So we assume that there are no, we don't know if there are any shortcut or any symbolic links because it's on the server. We don't have any information about that. Even if there are, we won't know where it is. But so in that case, we just assume there are no symbolic means or shortcuts. Mm It's a quite subtle bug. This function doesn't exactly do what it should do. So I highly encourage uh, you all <coughs> to look at what it returns. If you have a local setup or if you don't have, maybe you can try repo.it. Uh, 
shall open up the second hymn. If you have tried the first function and still not sure, you can check out what the other function does also. To be very sure what it does, you can try out different strings, give it different power paths. Yeah, another, another person got it, Skyler got it. Okay, Chuck needs it's over. Quite a few people got the got the answer. Around five people. So congrats. Now I'll share the answer. Okay, I'll clear this. It's okay, so over here on the right side. It's just uh let's say I'm running this on Linux. This is the file path. And if we pass it to this pass function, it will detect slash as the root. Then we strip away, but there's still the two slashes in front. And then if we resolve it, it will give us an absolute path. So this if is not enough. We need to do it many times until there's no more of the slash in front. So it's a quite subtle bug. So congrats to all that found it. And more interestingly, this is a, a bug in, wait. This is a bug in one of the NPM for our tools 
note tar. And this person got 10k from finding this bug. So if you all are actively finding bugs, maybe you all can earn this much money also. And over here, this one is in the write up. If you are interested, you can check out. I'll send the link later. Or actually, I'll just send it now to the chat. Yeah, so Node tar, it, it extracts files for NPM, I think. And all the tar balls are untrusted. So it must make sure that it only overrides files in under the current directory, which is similar to the example we have in the challenge we have. And then if the extraction can overwrite global files, then obviously it's not, it is malicious and it's not what a user would want. So this is the fix in the Node tar repo. They did a they used a while loop instead to strip away the stuff in front. And then over here, this one is just almost the same as the code snippet just now. So they remove this and use this more correct implementation of strip absolute part. Okay, so that's the web challenge. Now let's go on to the pwn challenge. So this is a piece of C code with two structures. One is a person, just some information inside, not so important. And then let's say we can also have a group of people. So inside there will be an, an integer, an unsigned integer, number of people, and also a array of person pointers. So we can have a list of pe uh, person, a pointers to this person struct. So like a list of persons, but it's a pointer. And then, so uh, this pointer thing is not super important, but it is just, uh, it just makes more sense for me to write it this way when I was writing this. And then we have one function to copy all the people from an array of groups. Just, uh, so this one, if you are familiar, if you are not familiar with C, normally we will use a pointer to a struct to represent an array because it points to the start of a uh, buffer with all the start points to the start of memory with all the objects and then the pointer points to the side we can use this operator to index into that memory that area of memory so let's say we first have this uh, total number of people set to zero and then we just accumulate it based on each group that uh, we are provided with so after we accumulated the total number of people that we want to copy we use malloc to allocate some memory that fits all the people that we want to copy over. And then we, if malloc fails, we return zero. So this one is supposedly safe and it should be safe because it just builds up and does nothing. And after that, we iterate through the groups and also for each group, we iterate through the person's array and do a deep copy of it into this uh, buffer that we just allocated. So I hope this code is simple and clear enough. But there's something wrong here. There's something wrong here that will lead to a crash. So that, that's the part of this challenge and we have to find out. And there's one assumption that we can make here for this code because I just can't think of a good analogy for a person or group. So, Let's just say that in each group you can have repeated uh, uh, repeated person. Let's say you have uh, one person Bob, and you can have a group with ten pers uh, in persons in a group. You can have ten pointers pointing to that same Bob. It's just uh, for the sake of so that should be intended. It's just that I couldn't think of a good analogy to allow that, but you can assume that for this program. So I'll just start the time now and. We can try to find the vulnerability here. If you have any questions, just feel free to ask if there's some assumptions that you feel you need to make or there's any code here that's unclear.
Okay, we have a question here. I'll paste it to everyone. So this one, does it copy the name and email uh, strings? Yeah, it does. It's a deep copy. So it will copy all the contents over. Because this person is an array of pointers. So I dereference the pointer. I get the, the actual contents and then I copy it over into my array of people. Okay, we got Yishuan that gives me the correct answer again. Too fast, but very good, yeah. So Yishuan has won two times $10. Oh, never mind. The next person that answers, that gives me the correct answer for this one first, will get the voucher for this challenge. So there's still a prize for this challenge. And three minutes has passed, so feel free to discuss in the chat. Because no one discussed just now. That's not, that's not what I hope for, but I also understand that there's some competition. Okay, so there's a question here, which I'll forward to everyone. Uh, maybe not a question, but an attempt. So over here, this part will, it will actually copy the whole object. It will not just copy the pointer. If it does copy the pointer, there will be a compilation error because it's a type mismatch. So over here, I intentionally let it deep copy the whole object over. Copy the, all the contents in this person. Okay, it's five minutes, so there's a hint. And the hint is just same as David's attempt, but it's not enough, yeah. Okay, there's another try, but I'll share with everyone also because 
I think it's helpful to everyone. So is it the size of this size of is a is a compile time thing. So whatever that re size of person resolves to, it will be determined compile time. It is not determined run time. So when the compiler compiles, it will already fill this in with a constant number based on the size of the struct. So this one, there's nothing wrong with the size of because I just want to let malloc, uh, malloc, uh, one malloc to allocate this number of person size big memories. So let's say there are let's say there are five people and this one probably will be 80 based on this one maybe there'll be it will be allocated 80 bytes for one person then for five people it will allocate with uh, a chunk uh, five chunks of 80 bytes contiguous chunks of memory uh, as one big buffer There's another try. Wait, not this one. So over here, do we need to cast? So if we check the malloc manual, it will say that malloc expects a size t, which is what size of will uh, is expected to return. But this one it will just be changed to a constant, and this one is an unsigned int. So when malloc expects a size t, which is eight bytes, white, whatever is inside here, it will be, it will be up casted or up converted into a size t or so. So there's nothing wrong over here. It will just be casted uh, for us. The compiler will cast this thing up to eight bytes for us. We don't need to cast it, it the compiler will do it also. Okay, Skyler got it right. So he'll claim the price for this one. And David, you are almost correct. If total number of people is greater than this, then it will be negative. But uh, yeah, let me think about it. By the way, I'll release the next few which is what some people have already started to explore. What if we have many groups with many people? So one idea is if we make total num equals a very big number that it is considered negative. Okay, yeah, I think it, originally I didn't intend for this to be in, intended for it to be unsigned, but yeah, it looks like there's some, it, it will be wrong also. So, looks good, yeah. Okay, so David also correct. Unintended vulnerability. But uh, since you have some time left, you can try to find the intended one.
also there was a question what happens if you give a very big value to malloc so if malloc is given a very big size it is okay it will find a way to allocate um so more on malloc internals if you give it a very big size it will use this thing called mmap to give a whole new allocate a whole new page for this allocation but otherwise if it's too big then it will just return zero that's why over here if it returns zero then we will just do, do nothing Okay, time's up. And now I'll share I'll, I'll share the answer. Okay, so here is the vulnerability. Some of you got it. Now just suppose that we have uh, this number of groups and this number of people. And over here, total num people is an unsigned in. So it is 32 bits wide. And or in other words, four bytes wide. So if we multiply them together, we will have this result but since it is just four bytes wide there'll be an integer overflow and we will just keep the last uh eh, what's this we will just keep the four bytes here so you uh underflow over you overflow and become a smaller number which is this so you will end up asking malloc to just allocate uh one hex one thousand people uh size of memory which is not good because we are expecting this much more so when we copy it will just overflow everything so i have a demo prepared I have a demo prepared here. So we have just one, this one person, I just reuse it for this list. That's why I gave the assumption just now. Yours, that's the point is that just to reuse this many times so we don't uh, create too many people. And then as given the example here, we have this number of people and number of groups. So this one is just an example. Make it bigger. So first, let's say uh, we give it uh, a smaller number. Then this one will tell us what is the number of people that malloc is told to allocate. So let me uh, see length. Uh, use this address sanitizer so that we can see the crash later. So we will be told to allocate this many blocks of people and then it will start to do the deep copy which is, will take quite long because this uh quite big number and I think zoom is using up a lot of CPU and then now let's give it a bigger one which is the number I prepared just now as an example. And you see that it is a smaller number than it should be. So now if I do this, okay. Okay, we'll have to wait a bit. It was fast just now, I think. I think Zoom is using too much CPU. <sighs> yeah, my, my com also quite slow. I think it's Zoom. Yeah. 
Okay, done. Yeah, address sanitizer says that there's a buffer overflow. Now, got a buffer overflow because we allocated an undersized. Allocated an undersized. Uh, I wrote it down somewhere, but I forgot where. Okay, anyways, we allocated an undersized buffer, and then we cop want to copy more stuff into it, so it over there's an overflow. So now, how do we exploit this? Is the question. What's the impact? It seems like it's quite hard because we need to allocate a lot of things, or we need to copy down a lot of things, and. We will need to copy a whole, like some two gig worth of stuff, or maybe eight gigs worth of stuff over into this buffer, because we have to give it a very big, uh, total number. So how can this be exploited? Now let's look at this uh call this piece of code from Core Graphics in iOS. It is for PDF parsing. It is used for this JBIG two stream thing. Which is something something in a related to PDF, I think, and some image stuff. That's why it is in core graphics. But anyways, I think this one, if you all have stared at the code just now for ten minutes, you will realize that this is quite similar. So we have an unsigned integer, and then we accumulate the sizes, and then we do a malloc with that accumulated size, but the uh, Allocated buffer is undersized because that's the in integer overflow I've shown just now. And then we still want to copy stuff into it. And that causes an overflow. And it is from this blog post uh, by Project Zero, this NSO zero click I message exploit, which was from around August or September last year. And, and this, it is this false entry exploit on I message by NSO which is some company that sells exploits to nation states. Uh, you can read this thing yourself and I'll just move on later in a while. Yeah, uh, they, they do uh, some, some shady stuff but that is not so shady according to the people that buy them, maybe. And then it is used to deploy this Pegasus malware, uh, spyware, to spy on some human rights activists or journalists. Yeah, and it's really messed up. So now we move on to crypto. I'll pass the time to Kelzin. Okay, uh, so now we start with crypto and yeah, a very simple XOR encryption. And uh, can such a simple encryption go wrong? So if you know the answer, you can send to me or just write in the chat. Oh, oh by the way, this is Python. I think that one is also important for me. Uh, no, you, you can't change the code. But uh, what, what I'm trying to ask is, is this... Okay, so actually there are something that goes wrong here. Uh, nope. Okay, uh, okay, so I think few of, few of the few of us uh, ask, uh, say that is it because of the seed? But uh, it's actually not because of the seed. So uh, in Python, right, if you did not specify the seed, I think depending on your Python version, you will always use the U, U random as the seed, which is the OS uh, random based on physical hardware or something like that. Yeah. So it's not because of the seed.
wait. <laughs> um, okay, uh, yeah, because random bytes is, is Python 3.9. But uh, inter the internal structure of random bytes is just random, uh, random bits, and then the number of bytes multiplied by eight. Uh, number of bits multiplied by eight. So it's like just a shorter version of random bits. So you can also kind of think of uh, if I use random bits instead of random bytes, then uh, what is the problem? I think uh, three minutes is up now. So maybe you can discuss the ideas in chat if you have. I think surprisingly, nobody has solved it now yet. <laughs> Uh, okay, so encrypt based on plain text size. Uh, that one is also okay. No, so because you, you are basically doing XOR encryption, and XOR encryption is theoretically the, the, the uh, unbreakable encryption. So uh, even though if you encrypt based on plain text size, what you get is like you might get maybe. Uh, so if you know a portion of text, then you only know a portion. Yeah. Uh, end up with now bytes. Uh, also not a big issue. So, uh, it can be any. The plain text can be any bytes, and then the encrypted outputs can also be any bytes. And uh, even you you can just convert it into a hex afterwards. So, now bytes is not an issue. Uh, plain text is Unicode. Then got issue. Uh, you can always con convert Unicode back to bytes, right? So it's also the same thing. Ah, yeah. So uh, I think we should got it. So uh, the random module is not cryptographically secure. So uh, it uses the machine twister. But, but how can we break it? Okay. So <laughs> since you have already got it. So, okay. Yeah. That's, that's the right answer. The problem is because the random is not perfectly, uh, it's not cryptographically secure random. Okay, uh, maybe I think I can show the first hint now. Uh, Daniel, can you change to the next slide? Yeah, so, so the first hint is, can we trust library? You, of, often we might just uh, use a library and just assume that the library is secure. But even despite, despite with just like the default Python uh, random library, can anything go wrong with that? Uh, it's, it's not the problem of the seed. So as, as I mentioned just now, if the seed is not, uh, if, if the seed is not, initially like given, then it will use the use ran u random as a seed. So the seed is not an issue. Uh, maybe Daniel you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so the second hint is how secure is the default Python random library? So you can go and take a look at the documentation of Python and the library, and it says that do not use this for, yeah. Random bytes is, uh, try as in, you, you want to try to answer it? Yeah, sure you can. <laughs> okay, so right, is it, 
uh, let's say we, we have a plain text that is like all now bytes. So after XOR, we just get back the we just get back the random bytes that was generated. Then from there we can predict like the future generations. Yeah, uh, so of course, uh yes, you need to know a little bit about the previous. So let's say if you know the previous text that has been encrypted, and then then you can get out the the, the OTP that is generated. And and if you uh, and the easiest way to get that is you encrypt a bunch of null bytes. And if you encrypt a bunch of null bytes, the uh, the resulting text is just the OTP itself. But uh, it doesn't really matter, right? So even just you 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 just have to know what is the initial plain text that you have encrypted. So if you have encrypted some plain text there, then you can always get out the OTP by just X all the plain text with the encrypted text. Oh, okay. I see. Thanks. So uh, I think because uh, Wei Cheng has already got the answer, and uh, maybe I can share share my screen to show some insights on this. Okay, so here uh, you look at the random, which is uh, in the Python documentation, and see this warning. Okay, the warning says that the random generators of this module uh, should not be used for security purposes. And if you want to use security or cryptographically use, see the secrets modules. And this kind of hinting that uh, the random is not a good cryptographically secure random. And it is indeed not. So the internal structure actually uses something called a, so this is the source code. Uh, I just click from there here. So the internal structure uses uh, Merson, Merson Twister call generator. And this is a PING that is that can generate a, that can generate a very statistically random numbers, but it, it is not cryptographically secure. So uh just look at the the code. Okay, um we can just search for get random bytes. Ran, uh, yeah, random bytes. So if you look at RAM bytes, it's basically just calling RAM bits and multiplying by eight and converting into bytes. So nothing special here. Okay. And what about this scan RAM bits? And if you if you try to look at look for it, right? Uh, it it will not have any code right uh, written in Python about what this get RAM bits is. It's because it is imported from here the uh, inherited from the random this this random and this is uh from the C code, the, uh, the Python C random module. And from here, you can also again, find the get ran bits and which is here. So this is the internal implementation of get ran bits. And you realize that, uh, of course, there are a lot of things here, but uh, this is not interesting. The interesting part is just uh, from here. So if you look at it, right, it will concat. So every time you generate, this random uh, generator will generate a, 32 bit random number and then it will concat uh, so it will drop the least significant bit so that it will provide you the thing that you want and if it's not enough so you just uh, kind of just extend it out and just keep on make sure that generating and make sure that uh, everything works out so uh, but the random module in python is not secure and in fact people have already written code to just crack the Python random module. What you have to do is you just have to submit 30, uh, six, I think it's yeah, two, uh, 624, 32 bits that are generated uh, numbers. And it can have a close to 100% of accuracy to predict the next random number. So let's say if you know a very, uh, so, so we look back at the, we look back at this again. If you know a, if you know the plain text and you know the previous OTP that has been generated to encrypt something, then you can easily predict the next few bytes that uh is going to produce with this get OTP. And that's basically uh, it. Uh. So I think I also met this question before in uh in StanCon CTF. So the previous StanCon CTF, one of the questions is also. Uh, the export is just 
finding this random, uh, breaking the Python random library. Yeah, and uh, to do it is extremely simple. You just use the code that has been written by someone else to crack it. Okay, so with all that being said, the, the idea that we learn from here is just that uh, try to understand the internal library that you are using every time when you are doing, uh, especially if you do with some security stuff and make sure that it is secure. So it's not uh, breakable. And yeah, so that's all for the crypto. Okay, so I'll continue with the reversing on. Just now I forgot to mention, this was the blog post I sent to the chat. This was a blog post that did an analysis, an analysis on the vulnerability by this uh, NSO exploit. The blog post goes into more detail on how NSO wrote the exploit and it is a very interesting read if you are interested. Really big brain ideas here that shows how uh, maybe shows that they earn a lot of money from writing all these exploits. Cost very hard. Okay, this one is the last challenge. It's a reversing one. And we have two functions. One, I just call it full, one, I call it good. So I just gave all these very short variable names because the goal of this challenge is to find out what does Gu do.
Hey, three minutes have passed. Feel free to discuss in the chat. Okay, five minutes. So first, just share a list of things which are not might not be very useful if you haven't, uh, unless you haven't already tried them. So you should just try giving some small numbers in each function. Firstly, full one. Give it some small numbers and see what it does. You'll find out it's a very well known and a very commonly used thing. If you have found out what foo does, then you are probably 70% there. Yes, foo is multiplication. You're almost there. Yeah, who is A times B mod C. Later I'll go through a, an explanation of why or how we can see it as a multiplication. Hmm, I think I got a typo in the code. Just a very small one. I think this should be 15, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, now I'm sharing this second hint. Goo is a very well-known 
encryption algorithm. We are almost there, but what is D? Ah uh, yeah. Yeah, you got the formula correct. Can you tell me what the algorithm is called? Based on the exponent that you might be familiar with. Yeah, Nigel got it, it's RSA. So you KS the answer. Uh, who should get the price? Nigel or Elzin? Okay, it's a bit of cheating because we are the people that organize, but I think you guys haven't, all right, but you believe they haven't seen the answer. Okay, I can half half up. You all settle yourself the price. But I'll go through the explanation why this one is multiplication. Yeah, I found this thing which I found to be quite interesting. That's why I'm sharing it here. So we just take these two numbers as an example. And let's say, uh, because 113, if we take the binary form or we split it into powers of two, then this is, it can be written like this. And then we can furthermore break them down, uh, expand it to be something like this. And then it will just be something like the original number times two plus the original number, then it will just times two a few times. Yeah, it's not very clear through this. So we can look at it in a different way. So here is the binary form of 113 as given in this example. And we iterate through the bits from right to left. So that's why we have MSD, most significant bit. We check it, we are checking the most significant bit. And Let's say it is one, then we will add it to the total. And then the next one is also one. So we add it to the total and multiply the whole thing by two. So originally it's two power zero and we multiply the whole thing by two after adding. And then you add one more and so on. Add and multiply. So over here, you see that A left shift by one is equivalent to A times, A equals to A times two. Similarly over here, but this one we don't really want to Think about it as multiplication. This one we think about it more like moving the whole thing to the left so that we look at the next bit from right to left when we do this uh, MSB check. But the second one is for multiplying A by two uh, as we, have, we are doing here. And so on, we just iterate through and this is the total. And this is the same as what we have up here as the uh, product. So oh, if we try to map it over, we see that it iterates from right to left with this, and then it also accumulates everything with this uh, D plus equals B. And now we look at this bottom part. It is just equivalent to D mod, uh, just applying uh, modulo C to D. Why we write it in this way instead of modulo, I guess. Uh, one way is it is easier to implement in assembly because you just mark subtract and then check and then add back if needed. And why do we not, uh, one question you might have is why do we subtract then compare? It is for, a, it's a good optimization uh, because if you subtract, if you do a comparison, let's say D less than C, on the CPU, you have to do a subtraction of D minus C and then check with less than zero. That's how the CPU compares between two numbers. So we don't want to do an extra subtraction. So this is why uh, we have it like this now. And yeah, as given in the chat just now, this function just returns A times B. No, I don't know the brackets. Should, should there be brackets? Okay, A times B modulo C. And then now we have time to look at GU. So if you have 
if you know the idea of binary exponentiation, you can break down a big exponentiation uh, operation into just squaring it many times, like this, like x square, 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 16 times will give you 65536. And this is why RSA, they like to get, they use numbers like, uh, oh, I'll, I'll share about this first. Yeah, 65537, you can just multiply by x again after getting 65536. And yeah, it's what Kelsey shared. RSA, we like to use, numbers like three or uh what else about yeah three three is one of them and then but three is a bad RSA P and then six five five three seven is another one that is used a lot of times I think so over here we map them over and we get this yeah Kelsey you already know this format prime, so you already know it's RSA. Why you give chance to Nigel? Uh, okay, you can get the given number a to the power of six five five three seven. I think there's an off by one error here. Maybe this should be fifteen because you know, if it's fifteen, you go through it six. You will square it fifteen times. Uh, I cannot think. I cannot think now, but it's either fifteen or sixteen, and then. Modulo, so it's just RSA. And this one is identified in a ransomware called Black Matter Ransomware. <clears throat> it's a, I got this from a blog post by Mandian. So Mandian is quite cool because they just got acquired by Google Cloud. I think joining or acquired, I can't remember the exact term. And this is what they did. They were trying to find out what encryption this black matter is using, and it was not very easy for them, but in the end, they identified it as a 1024-bit RSA. And they shared it in a blog post, but here is kind of a summary. So here are the assembly instructions that were used. So because it's a 1024-bit, they did a big integer thing where they have a, a series of 32 bit numbers. So they first set it up and then, for example, for the doubling, they use this RCL, which is rotate left and carry, something like that. So it's like shifting the whole, shifting everything right by one bit because they have many 32 bit numbers. So they do it to all of them. And then here is the part where they, after they do the doubling, they do a subtraction by the modulus and then they check if it is greater than, if it is less than zero, then you have to add back the modulus. So it's something like this. And so if you manage to identify that it is multiplication and binary exponentiation, then yeah, yeah it's a very good job. You manage to find out what this ransomware did. And that's all we have for today's session. So it's a quite shorter session than before. I hope you all learned a lot along the way and like how this, sometimes we do CTS, but it's like just playing some puzzles, but hopefully you also learn how these things relate to some uh, real examples.